Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving the crypto economy. I'm Meher Roy, and today we have a very interesting episode discussing sharding and a project that has a unique approach at sharding blockchains. We have on the show Zinshu Dong and Amrit Kumar from Zilliqa. Zinshu is the CEO of Zilliqa and Amrit is the crypto lead there. Zilliqa is an innovative blockchain platform which has a, a, a sharded blockchain already running as a private testnet. Zinshu and Amrit, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's our pleasure to be here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So before we start talking about Zilliqa and what that project is trying to do, tell us a bit about your backgrounds and how you came to be involved in the blockchain space. Sure. So maybe I can start. Sure. Uh, my my name is Shinshu. Uh, I'm from the more technical side. Uh, in my PhD, I worked on cybersecurity for web browsers and web applications. So later, I worked on you know uh, the security for control software, control software for larger systems like smart grid, transportation, Internet of Things, things like that. Of course, I started to develop a personal interest later on, uh, on blockchain itself. Uh, until, you know, Predict Saxena talked to me again. You know, I used to work with him very closely during my PhD time. So after a few years, he talked to me again. Hey, I started a company, you know, we are working on blockchain. Why don't you come and join us? So that's, that's the time I really started to think seriously that I should, you know, really work full time on the blockchain. And, and I, I, I did so. After a few months, I joined his company and started to develop this uh, scalable blockchain technology in, into you know, commercialization, into uh, deployment as a permission blockchain. You know, that was about you know, more than one year ago. And that's how I started working, working on, on blockchain. Of course, you know, this year we started this new project, Zilliqa. I'm, I'm very excited to bring that technology into a much larger scale as a public blockchain. You know, that's very briefly about myself. Yeah, so for me, I, I have a PhD from India, France. And um, then I came over to Singapore. I started working as a postdoc under Pratik Saxena. And then I started discovering blockchain and, and uh, there are different, different uh, uh, problems and solutions. And my essential background is on applied cryptography and privacy. So again, it was the same kind of story. Pratik called me up and said, yeah, are you interested in, in, in developing something like Zilliqa? I said, why not? And then I joined the project. So, yeah. Cool. So I think, uh, I think very few of our listeners would explicitly know about Pratik Saxena and, the, and his group at NUS Singapore. So as, like I've, I've seen a lot of papers from this group, including, um, so there was a paper called like Demystifying Incentives in the, con- in the Consensus Computer right uh, that 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 um, that posited that there was some kind of verification dilemma in in a blockchain like ethereum and that translated through multiple different uh, technological jumps became like like truebit uh, another project to come out of uh, uh, this group is like loy's work uh, starting with um, like sm- secure smart contract languages and then uh, ultimately decentralized exchanges and Kyber network. So that is uh, so Loy also did his PhD as far as I know from from this group. And another project that I know of personally is just this one, Zilliqa. So there's there's been at least like three uh, three three interesting projects that that have come out of this group. That's unusually productive for an that's very unusually productive for an academic group uh, in any university, I would say. Yeah, yeah, you know, we are, we are very fortunate to be part of the group as well. So, you know, the whole idea of Zilliqa, uh, you know, is, is inspired by this original academic research paper co-authored by Loy and Predict. It's called Elastico. You know, that's that's where all these uh, high-level ideas of sharding uh, started. Okay, so le- le- let's let's drive down into Zilliqa. So Zilliqa is a is is a is a sharded public blockchain with its own cryptocurrency uh, called Zilinx. But before we drive down into uh, what ex- exactly the way the technology works, uh, let's talk a bit about scalability in in general, right? So uh, our viewers know about the scalability problems of blockchains because we have talked about that many many times. The thing that is sort Perhaps a bit less known is what exactly is sharding? We have this word, but is there like a good definition for it? 
I don't know. I, I guess I will not try to give a very uh, formal definition of sharding because uh, I think that this term sharding was invented uh, many years ago in the, and in the database uh, community. But when you know, people bring this idea of sharding into public blockchain to, to try to make the blockchain more scalable, the high level idea of sharding is quite straightforward. Um, let's just assume we have a blockchain network of 1000 nodes. So what sharding does is to divide these 1,000 nodes into, let's say, 10 shards, you know, with 100 nodes each. So then what it does is to uh, process different uh, transactions in different shards, you know, disjoint set of transactions. So then you can achieve some level of uh, parallel processing. So this in itself improves uh, the throughput of the blockchain by, by you know, a large, a large factor. So this is this is a high level idea of sharding. Of course, you know to to really work it out uh, to make sure this process is secure and it's very efficient. You know that that's where you know the complexities come. Like sharding, I, I presume is like this technique that has been used at different sort of database designs across time, right? Right. Um, and now we are bringing that sort of knowledge and and those techniques from uh, into the blockchain space, which has its own unique challenges while you, while you shard the blockchain. Right. So like is sharding a single monolithic technique or are there different kinds of sharding that have, that are possible? I, th I think there are different uh, possibilities or, or different variants of sharding. So uh, number one, uh, I think where most people talk about sharding, they actually refer to something we would call a uh, state sharding. So that's maybe the closest, uh, uh, you know, de uh, derived uh, idea from the database sharding concept. So what state sharding does is essentially it will divide the nodes in the network into different parts. So when one node belongs to one part or one shard, that node uh, only stores data and information for that particular shard. In other words, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't know what's going on in another shard. You know, what's going on outside the shard itself. So th this clearly has uh, several advantages. So number one, it significantly reduces you know, the size of data each node needs to store and reduces you know, the number of uh, transactions each node needs to process. And it also reduces uh, the volume of data that needs to be propagated across the network because you, know, you just you know, send some data to this shard. You don't need to send the same piece of data to another shard, for example. So these are all these advantages of, of state sharding. That's why this concept is very interesting. But uh, on the other hand, there are also many challenges to, you know, to do this properly. So number one is uh, security. So if one node stays within one shard, and then it doesn't actually understand, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, knows outside that shard doesn't understand things going on inside this shard. So if attackers just focus all the power attacking this particular shard, you know, over time, this may become an issue. So this is number one. And number two is about uh, redundancy or resilience, because uh, instead of, let's say, a whole network of 20,000 nodes storing uh, 20,000 copies of a particular piece of information, now you only have, let's say, 500 or 1,000 nodes keeping that piece of information. And once one third or half of those nodes have a problem with that information, either they are you know, compromised or attacked or deleted or somehow just lost such information, it's a problem because nobody else in this network uh, you know, understands uh, this particular piece of information. So these are some of the issues uh, I see. Yeah, if I may add to this, I mean, this whole idea of state sharding per se, it essentially came from Bitcoin model, right? Where you have this UTXO model and you want to, if you want to know whether an output has been spent or is still unspent, you want to have to store and you have to store the entire history. And that history can be very huge. So you need a way to kind of divide that history into chunks so that each node only has to store a part of that, 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 that entire history. So the, the story comes from, comes from these, this UTXO or Bitcoin kind of model. Yeah, this is this state sharding. Of course, you know, uh, we, we, we started this idea or this direction of possibilities when we design uh, the Zilliqa's protocols. Uh, our sort of conclusion uh, at that time was it's very challenging to do that. We would rather need more time to work on it. Uh, on the other hand, 
what Zilliqa currently does is something we can call uh, network sharding or transaction sharding. That means for each node, it still stores all the current state up, you know, up to date, uh, let's say account balances for, for the entire blockchain network. Uh, so, so it's not state sharding. But on the other hand, we shard the processing of the transactions. So that means when we have different shards, we will send different transactions to different shards for processing. And eventually, you know, all such information for the next block will be aggregated and still sent through to all the nodes. So you can see easily here, we, you know, the, the pros are very simple. We, we, we basically avoid many of these security and resilience challenges uh, in state sharding. But on the other hand, there are additional challenges in, in doing only uh, network sharding compared to state sharding because every node, we still need to store lots of information and still we need to uh, propagate lots of information to all the nodes. So, you know, these are some of the places Zilliqa is, you know, doing the innovation. Ah, uh, okay. So, so when 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 you were speaking, in show like sort of imagination came into my mind, which is that we can imagine, we can imagine like any blockchain first, like like a blockchain like Bitcoin. Let's imagine that as sort of uh, sort of like a, a a government office, right? Like so, mm -hmm. so there's this there's this government office and. They're like employees in that office and all of these employees, they are just accountants, right? right. Uh, and these accountants are basically all the nodes. Um, so these are the, these are the like full nodes of, of, of the system. So whenever like you want to process a transaction, you, you, you basically like go to this building and you like put the transaction in and all of these employees, they maintain their own book and they're going to add. Yeah. They're going to verify that your transaction is right and they're going to add it to the book. And the the uh, the working in this sort of office, this governmental office is designed in a way that each employee will add the same number of same transactions in the same order in that in that book. But that a that book is replicated across all of the employees. So if there are like a thousand employees in these this building, each one of them has the same copy of that book. And at any instant of time, each of these employees is working on that on a same set of new transactions to add on on this to this book. They are verifying the same trans set of transactions, right? And so that's like that's like Bitcoin. That's like Ethereum today. So each employee is redundantly doing that work, and all of them are redundantly maintaining that the same copy of of this book. Hmm. Now, what, what Zilliqa does is like once one step ahead. So what Zilliqa does is, okay, there's, there's the same 1000 employees now in the Zilliqa blockchain, but the same 1000 employees need to maintain the same copy of that book. And that book contains all the transactions that happened in Zilliqa. But the advantage is that uh, if there's like 1000 employees, then we can have say groups of 100 employees in some way that are uh, working on different transactions. So let's say employee one until employee 100 works right. on a, one particular set of transactions at the same time. Employee 100 to 200 works on a different set of transactions at the same time and so on. So uh, there are like 10 subgroups in this government office, each of them processing their own set of transactions. But each employee ultimately needs to keep track of transactions that not, not only their group has processed, but also transactions processed by the other groups as well, right? So that's sort of the Zilliqa model, uh, analogy for the Zilliqa model. And then you could have a higher level model, which is like state sharding, in which these 1000 employees are again divided into 10 groups of 100 each. They are processing their own sets of transactions. But uh, each employee is maintaining the books. Each employee is maintaining the ledger or UTX set or book only for the transactions processed there by their group. That's right. So if I'm in group number seven, my book contains only the transactions processed by group number seven. And if, some, if my friend is in group number five, they, on, they only contain transactions processed by group number five. But even though my book and my friend's book do not have intersection in the, in the transactions we have processed. 
somehow there is a way of making sure that uh, there is no double spending. Like I'm not processing a transaction and he's processing another transaction and they are in conflict with each other. So, so that kind of thing, which is the ultimate in sharding would be state sharding. Yes. Yes. And Zilliqa is not state sharding. It is, it is that in that intermediate level where I, as a bookkeeper need to keep track of all of the transactions, other groups apart from mine are also processing, but per se, my computational cost in verifying transactions is limited to those processed my, by my group only. Exactly. exactly. So I think this is a very good analogy. Uh, I just want to clarify a little bit uh, on the Zilliqa model here. So I, I think state sharding is very interesting, but you know, there are many challenges where we discussed security, redundancy, and this you know, cross-shard communication. Basically, these are main challenges we, we should you know, work very hard on to resolve. But at this stage, I still cannot know for sure whether state sharding is the ultimate you know, objective for, for sharding, for example. Because if you look at Zilliqa model, uh, you know, all these accountants process different uh, employees' uh, transactions, and then eventually uh, every accountant still be updated on every every other accountant's processing uh, process the transactions, right? So, th but this is this is the current uh, implementation of Zilliqa, I would call. But the design of Zilliqa is not limited to this. So, for instance, to address this issue of you know excessive uh, storage requirements, so basically each accountant needs to know every single transaction, right? We can reduce that because uh, when we say we don't do state sharding, that means every accountant needs to know the balances for every employees. But on the other hand, it is not necessary that every accountant also keeps a precise record of all the transactions, right? So there's a difference. If you look at like Ethereum's account-based model, you just need to keep the balances. You don't need to know all the histories. Mm. Most of the applications, as I see, only need to understand the final balances. But some applications will also need to you know, access uh, all the history, like Etherscan, for example. So in, in that sense, we can, we can you know, reduce the storage for every accountant by applying another mechanism, something like DHT, for example, you know, distributed hash table. To, to allocate, you know, which node was store which which historical data. So that's only about the historical, you know, you know transactions. But uh, this is sort of orthogonal to the fact that every accountant still knows uh, the account balances for all employees. So that's just one thing I want to add. So yeah, that that's 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 like super important. So basically, like what what you're saying is like even though if I'm in like group one. And I need to know some like something about group seven. There's there's ways in which I can reduce uh, the total set of knowledge I need about what went on in group seven, group eight. So instead of knowing all of the transactions that happen, I could just know uh, the state of the ledger after those transactions were processed. Exactly. Exactly. So like one of the one of the like doubts I have in my mind, uh, and I think this is a doubt in many people's minds is, if you look at the blockchain space today, there's there's two kinds of projects broadly. There's like projects like Cosmos and Polkadot that are, that are like promising interoperability. And now we see just the beginning of projects that are actually offering sharding. So like Zilliqa is probably the first, at least it's the first we have interviewed. What is the difference between interoperability and sharding? Yeah, this is a very good question. You know, to to me, uh, you know, I can't I can't really draw an absolute line between interoperability and 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 sharding, especially if you look at uh, things like Plasma, for example. Like you have a main chain and you have side chains. So so in, in my view, usually when we say sharding, it's still about sharding within one blockchain. So it's it's one single, you know, unified blockchain. But uh, but yeah, I mean, whether over time we can, when the interoperability part is very mature, uh, whether whether the the boundary is still very clear or not, I'm I'm actually not very sure. Yeah, I mean, I I, I mean, I completely agree that you know you have different problems in in the blockchain space, and different blockchain technologies they they come up and they solve different problems, right? 
Now the solution is how to unify them, right? You can't have 1 million blockchains and standing all alone. You want to wait so that one blockchain can talk to another blockchain. And this is where this interoperability comes from. And we definitely need, need a technology like this so that one, one blockchain technology can talk to another blockchain technology and probably have, you know, take benefits from, from the other technology. And I think, but they're completely complementary things, right? Solving, uh, let's say, scalability problem and design, designing a protocol that allows you to interoperate or, you know, talk, communicate with other blockchains, they're kind of orthogonal problems. So what do you mean when you say they're orthogonal problems? which means that they solve two different problems. Blockchains which address scalability or let's say throughput, they want to address or they try to address, how, I mean, how can you increase? What's the technology that you should employ? What's the protocol that you should employ so that you can increase the throughput of that blockchain? Hmm. So this could be a, a, a blockchain that tries to solve scalability, right? You could imagine blockchains such as Zcash, which, which are mainly focused towards privacy. So they want to ensure that whenever you do a transaction, it's private which could be, let's say, hiding your amount, hiding who is the sender, who is the recipient, and you know, all these kind of features. Now, they, both, both these you know, blockchains, they solve different problems, right? One is solving scalability, the other is kind of attempting to solve the privacy part. Now, you need something in between that can allow you to talk, you know, try to communicate from one blockchain to the other one. So that's another, this, this another blockchain will be solving another problem, which is very, I mean, all three are very crucial for you know, for the blockchain ecosystem to work in, in a really nice way. But they all solve different problems. It's like we imagine this government office, this government building with a thousand employees working in it. And scalability is, okay, we have a thousand employees. How do we get them to do the most work securely, right? Yeah. And interoperability is sort of the problem that, okay, let's say we have like, not one, but five different government offices, each having a thousand employees. How do we make sure like that uh, we can have things where um, I can submit a paper to this first office and then the uh, and then you can shuffle it around between these two different government offices and do something which like sort of, I don't know, allows these offices to collaborate. So interoperability is like a postal system between uh, between these offices or these government buildings, it's more like a postal system, a good postal system, whereas scalability is uh, getting the employees in one building or in one office to be able to do more work than what they can today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's our understanding. Of course, you know, the difference uh, between interoperability and sharding is really the difference between, you know, whether this is a one government body or five government bodies. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So, you know, let's 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 go down to like how Zilliqa achieves this this uh, this level of sharding. So, like, could you give us a broad overview of how the network is designed? Yeah, Zilliqa is uh, you know it's it's slightly complicated, but but I think I think you know it's it's also very based on several important building blocks. So, number one, we need to make sure uh, not not every node can create arbitrarily many identities because you know if you if you can create arbitrarily many identities in the in the consensus process if you oversimplify it as a voting you outvote all the good guys so that's why we need to uh, establish some way to sort of uh, let people only create uh, proper identities you know that that's something we need we can solve so that's where we have a proof of work so people have to do a proof of work before they can enter into our consensus protocol. And okay, now the question comes, how, how do we do this? How, how do we, you know, sort of enforce a proof of work? Who will are, who are check, you know, who, who is running proof of work correctly or not correctly? So that's why we established something called a directory service committee. You know, this is just one, one name we give. Basically, this is the overarching layer. So we will have nodes competing a proof of work to get into this particular overarching committee. So once this committee is formed, this committee becomes the body that will check other nodes. So when other nodes doing proof of work, it will check whether this is correct or not correct. And then those nodes who have done correct uh, proof of work will be allowed to participate in the consensus process. 
And this overarching directory service committee, again, is the body that sort of divides all these, you know, good nodes, nodes who have passed POW into different shards. And then this overarching committee also uh, decides how do we send different transactions to different shards for processing. And eventually aggregate all the process transactions into the final block. So if we go back to the you know government and accountants model, so this is like a, like the top governing body. So the the selection criteria is are also higher. And then once this uh, government body is selected, it can you know sort of allocate different accountants to different departments and decide which department uh, processes uh, which sort of employee data. So so this is a high level design of the network. One key thing we have to uh, make sure. Uh, you know, this is done properly is that this so-called directory service committee has to be decentralized. You know, otherwise it's very easy. We just pick five or even 100 so-called super nodes. We just trust them, let them decide. That, that in our view, is, is not ideal because, you know, people can keep their power attacking these nodes if they are static. Uh, and, and these nodes may be corrupt in, in whichever way. So th this directory service committee has to be decentralized. So the election of this committee itself is also uh, by proof of work. So that's fair to everyone. And we keep updating uh, the composition of the committee, you know, to make sure this is a dyna dynamic uh, committee. It's not like static forever. So this is a high level uh, idea of, of Zilliqa's network design. So would you like to add something, Amrit? Well, I mean, the, the, as she just said, you know, you want to have you want your network, so you know, imagine your network, right? You want to divide that network into subparts. But you need some, some, you know, somebody or a, a group that, that's going to control that in a way that it's going to say, you know, you go to this shard, you go to this shard, you go right. to this shard, right? So you need a body that's going to, you know, run that thing, right? And then that is the DS committee. And as you said, you don't want it to be one person because then you can attack that. You want it to have, because this, this, this body will have the right to say, you know, this 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 node is going to be assigned to this shard. So you don't want to have an app, you don't want to give one person absolute right to do whatever he wants. And that's why you need to have a sufficient number of nodes in that in that body, in that committee. And then you want to elect them in a fair manner as well. So these are the crucial points that you have to do when, when you want to do sharding. So apart from the directory service committee, like so we have these groups that are uh, that are processing transactions and this directory service is sort of the administration that allows sort of these these groups to even coordinate and these groups to even form uh, yeah, process correct. transactions and then maybe we even even coordinate so that's the directory service committee that's in the sort of in the center and then how how are these groups um, and then you have groups that like process transactions. So if I'm a node, if I'm a new node that is like joining this network, basically like a new accountant or new employee coming into this network, I have the choice of either trying to go and become a member of the directory service committee or only become a member of one of these groups or become try to become members of like one group and the directory service committee, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I understand. Okay, okay. So, uh, so, so, tell us, like, like how how I can enter the directory service committee, or how I could let's say let's say let's take the earlier example. It's like there's a thousand nodes with like ten shards or ten processing groups, each with a hundred nodes. So, if I want to let's say join shard seven or group seven, how how can I do that? And then if I want to join the directory service committee, how can I do that as a new node? So in general, a node cannot choose which shard or which group it wants to join because that, that sort of decided uh, based on some randomness uh, in, in the, in the you know, proof of work result it generates. It, it, it's designed that way. Otherwise, if I can choose which shard I want to join, I can you know, group with all these bad guys. Let's, let's all go to shard seven. And compromise that shot. You know that that's a high level idea. So what happens is uh, at certain intervals, let's say at uh, at every two hours, roughly two hours, it's based on block time, of course. Let's say roughly at every two hours, the existing directory service committee 
will announce an open competition. It will announce say now there is a, a new proof of work scheme. Everyone can participate. And then any node, node existing in this network or outside, you know, that's fine. Any node can, ju can just join this competition and, and try to solve that puzzle of this proof of work. So the winner will be sort of agreed on by existing uh, members of this directory service committee. And then it will join this committee. By doing that, the committee will also uh, ask the oldest member in the committee to leave. This, this is the way how it's updated. So the membership of the committee is like churned or yes, changed yes. every two hours. And then the process for like entering the uh, committee is to solve this proof of work. So yes, let's say yes. like in, in two hours, there's this proof of work. So I participate in that puzzle. And if I solve it, I become part of the committee. And then the oldest member of that committee will end up end up leaving. Yes, yes. Right? Imagine this is a chain. This is a, this is a blockchain as well. So uh, whenever there's a winner of that proof of work, uh, that name will be added into a new block and the block is appended to that chain. And then, you know, if you go back to, you know, along the chain, you, then you can move, remove uh, the oldest block. So what happens in those two hours? So let's say like, okay, I'm a new node. I ended up, I succeeded in joining the DS committee. And now for the next two hours, there's not going to be another, um, another puzzle or another node joining us. So, so the so set of DS committee nodes is now known for two hours. What do we do during this period? So two hours is just an example, you know, we can do it every 30, 30 minutes, for example. So, so this is the interval where we will sort of elect a new member of the DS committee. Um, and then, you know, at that time, when we, when, after we, you know, elect a new member into the committee, uh, the DS committee can call another round of proof of work to sort of incorporate new nodes. And this process, of course, can be done more frequently. You know, it can be done like let's say every 20, 20 minutes as well. So these are parameters we can tune. But basically, the DS committee can announce another proof of work scheme to ask new nodes to join. They will not join the DS committee, but they will join into that groups uh, for doing consensus and process transactions. So this is another uh, proof of work scheme we we leverage on, on Zilliqa. And you, this this also you know understandably this is also much easier because it's not that competitive. In the DS committee election, it's very competitive. Everyone is competing for that one position. And this time it's not. For example, we are accepting 20,000 nodes. So as long as you are, you know, you are a reasonable computer, you should be able to join. And then according to the result of your uh, POW, uh, you will be sharded into respective uh, committees. And this logic for sharding is decided by the DS committee. Uh, Amrit, anything to add? Yeah, so, so there, there are two points here, right? So the basic idea is that you want to elect members in the shard and you want to elect members of the committee. Okay, there are two points. Now, there are two ways of doing it. One is that you elect all of them together, right? And how could you do that? You say that everybody is going to solve POW and everybody's going to submit their POW. And you could say, look, look I, have, I have received all these POWs. I'm going to sort them out. And I will take the smallest one, let's say, because there's randomness in POW. So, you know, you cannot be, that cannot be expected. You can say that, look, I'm, I'm going to sort all of that and I will take the smallest one and that will be, go to the DS one and the rest will go to the shard, right? This is one way of doing it. We said that, you know, we want to give freedom. So we want to have some freedom. So we said, we are going to decouple these, this, these two elections. So we would say, first elect the DS people, the DS member, and then ask them to elect the shard members, okay? So that's why we have one POW to elect the DS committee member and second POW to elect your shard members. And mm. the idea is that if you decouple it, then you have some freedom in saying that, you know, second one can be done more faster than, you know, more frequently than the first one and so on and so forth. So that gives you freedom about deciding how frequently you want to do, uh, uh, the, how, how frequently you want to elect the members in the shard and how frequently you want to elect a member in the committee. And that's why we decouple uh, the proof of work. Okay, okay. So, so basically, like if I'm a new node, I can first become a member of the shard by solving this POW. And then like this, this uh, DS committee can last for, for let's say a longer duration. And in these, in this longer duration, like there are like shorter durations where there's, where there's sort of elections of 
for puzzles that are going to determine who processes like who belongs to which shard and that is a separate proof of work and I, and I could conceivably participate in that as well yes and like let's say be allocated to shard 7 and then I go and process transactions inside yeah. shard yeah. 7 yeah. and okay. after ne the next round maybe you are reshuffled to shard 5 let's say so okay so in, in the secondary election, it's like I'm in shard 7 first, then shard 5, then shard 3, mm -hmm. then yeah. again back to shard 7, shard 9. So I'm being, I'm being shuffled around. And not only me, yeah. but like all of the nodes, we are, being, we are being shuffled around really well. And then if I'm in the DS committee, after let's say a certain point of time, I will become the oldest member of the DS committee. And then I will have to exit that committee. If I want to rejoin it, I will have to win the uh, lottery for that DS committee again. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, so, that's, for example, winning the lottery for the DS committee once might entitle me to be there uh, for quite a long while. While while the oldest nodes getting keep getting churned out, right? Uh, I might be I might be there. Okay. Okay. So that makes sense. So let's say like now I'm assigned to shard number seven. Um, so and then there are like a hundred other nodes that are assigned to shard number seven uh, for the next twenty minutes. Uh, how, how do we process transactions in that chart? How do we come to consensus amongst these 100 nodes? Yeah, so what happens is that, let's say a user creates a, a transaction and it goes to the network. So let's suppose for, for the timing that it ends up in that chart. And why, why would happen is that uh, the transaction has a sender's address, right? So what, what might happen, so let's imagine that you have only two shards for the timing, okay? Just to simplify the scenario. So we have only two shards. And how this transaction will go through is that uh, this center address will be, will be checked. And let's say this last bit is zero, could be zero or one. And if it's zero, it will go to the first shard. If it's one, it goes to the second shard. Mm. Now, if you have more shards, of course, you can do a modular arithmetic and then you could end up in a specific shard. So a user sends a transaction, it goes to a specific shard depending on uh, the center's address. And then there will be a consensus protocol within that shard for that for that transaction. Uh huh. So, so basically, like uh, this is a way of automatically preventing double spend in some way because if I am a sender of a particular transaction, um, my transaction can end up only in one shard and it cannot go to two shards because my address is sort of known and that address is going to the address triggers a deterministic computation, which sort of gives the output as like which shard this transaction belongs to. Exactly. So if, if you're sharding with respect to, I mean, if you're, if you're assigning the transaction with respect to the sender's address, you have this advantage, right? Yeah. But let's say if you, if you don't do that, if you instead do with, with respect to the receiver's address for some, some reasons, you won't be able to do preventable spend. So sharding with respect to uh, sender's address, this automatically gives you a, uh, uh, double spend kind of prevention. So this is like 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 a transaction partitioning scheme in, in in some way, right? Like so, it's like the government office. These transactions are coming in, and we need to determine uh, which group they are going to go to. And this is the simple heuristic. Are there other heuristics you considered, or this one was the clear winner? Well, I I don't I don't remember if you tried anything else. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it was so obvious that it, you yeah. know it gave you a, a pretty nice solution. Why would you bother about thinking anything else? It was, okay. it was certainly a clear winner. Okay, so what is the consensus algorithm inside one shard, and like, what are sort of the performance characteristics of of a, of an individual shard? It's it's largely uh, based on uh, the, the called practical presenting for tolerance, so PBFT, uh, but you know. We understand PBFT performance very efficiently for a small size network, a network like 100 nodes, 200 nodes. Uh, it, it, it can generate very high throughput. But on the other hand, when you have a larger network, a network of thousands of nodes or tens of thousands of nodes, then the uh, performance of PBFT will deteriorate. This is in contrast with uh, Nakamoto uh, protocols where you know, the throughput is very stable, uh, whether it's large network or small, small network. So, but PBFT has uh, several advantages. So the main advantage we like, uh, you know, about PBFT is it gives finality. So that means once you agree on a block or 
you know, a few transactions you want to accept, that, that's done. You know, there's no way uh, you can rewrite that history. So what we do is uh, we leverage from some of the existing literature to uh, use collective uh, signing or Schnorr signature to address one particular uh, performance issue in, uh, in PBFD. Basically, uh, in PBFD, it's all about those talking to each other, saying, I have seen this, uh, you have seen this. Okay, I have seen enough people telling me they have seen this. So when they send such messages, they have to uh, use this digital signature to say, this is really from me. You know, otherwise, malicious nodes can, can just you know, craft messages which uh, seem to be from all the other nodes. You know, that's why you need digital signature. But then when you have a very large uh, network, like the 1,000 nodes, the size of the digital signature will become a performance bottleneck when you send these messages across. So that's why we leverage the Schnorr signature to reduce the size of the signature from, uh, you know, we call it O of N, that means, you know, it grows linearly to the number of nodes in the network to a constant number. So that's a big performance, uh, you know, benefit we, 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 we obtain from there. And, you know, Amrit will tell us more about what are the issues with directly leveraging the Schnorr signature? You know, there are also security issues that we have to address with additional steps. But you know, that's that's one idea. And another idea we we try to develop in this uh, efficient consensus algorithm uh, is that uh, we we play around different uh, network topologies. So you can have uh, a random topology. You can have a tree topology, which is uh, in the original proposal of leveraging uh, Schnorr signature. Uh, and, and, you know, a star topology. And eventually we choose the star topology as we think this is the most efficient way uh, to send messages across. So there are, you know, different aspects we had to enhance on, on PBFD. And Amrit can talk more about the Schnorr signature part. Sure, sure. Uh, just before that, I would, I would like to highlight a quick point on finality, right? So uh, if you compare, let's say, a consensus protocol a la Nakamoto and... Uh, PBFT or BFT, classical BFT kind of consensus protocol. Uh, BFT or PBFT, they give you finality, which means that if a block or set of transactions goes into the blockchain, that's final. You, know, you won't have, you don't, don't need confirmations on top of that. This has many advantages. One is that because it's you have finality, you don't have to care about confirmations because it's done, right? The moment it goes into the blockchain. The second guarantee that, it, that you have is that you don't have to keep the previous history, right? If you look at the Nakamoto kind of consensus protocol, let's say uh, a node does POW and submits a block, you don't know whether it's going to be the final block until you receive a bunch of confirmations. So you have to store that block for a while. While in case of PBFT kind of consensus protocol, the moment you, you, you agree on a block it, and it's final, you don't have to store blocks that, you know, that, that were received previously. You can just get your state, update your state, and then you're done. So it, it also tells you to some extent that state sharding is not that important when you have finality. Great point, great point. So the way the way my imagination is now, so let's say like I'm now a user of the system, I'm not a node, and I'm sending a transaction to Zinshu. So I, I create I create my transaction. It it looks like a fairly standard transaction. Um so I'm, I'm assuming I'm in my head. It's it's like an it's like an Ethereum like transaction. There's a gas price right. and yeah. um, it's like there's a, my account number, amount, gas price, like code stuff like that, right? And um, and like data. And so when I send this uh, transaction to the network based on my address, this transaction will be allocated to one of the shards. Inside that, uh, once the nodes of the shard listen to my transaction. They'll participate in a, a consensus algorithm, so the, which is like practical Byzantine fault tolerance space. So this is the same as like uh, things like Cosmos, uh, similar to things like Cosmos, or what they're doing. And then a block is created and that block has my transaction in it. And as long as soon as I see a block in that shard with my transaction in it, uh, I'm done. For, for all intents and purposes, as a user, I can, Take that as a guarantee that my transaction is confirmed. Is that correct? Uh, at the high level, it's something like that. But but you know, there there are some there are some potential issues in accepting uh just whatever that comes out of the 
a particular shard because you know we still need some verification uh, from from the DS committee because when you see this uh, this block, how do we verify? How do we verify that more than two thirds of the nodes sort of agree to this this you know sort of we call it micro block? You know that that is one more step we do in Zilliqa. So what happens is that the moment you create a block at the shard level, it kind of gets to the DS level. And then DS level, so every shard will propose a block, we call it micro block. So the first shard will give a micro block, the second shard will give its own micro block, and then it, they will all go to the DS committee. And then this DS committee will aggregate these two micro blocks into what is called a final block. And then final block kind of gives you the finality. So there's, there's ah. another one, one level up. And the, the DS committee, once it's like it, it collects these two micro blocks and wants to put them in the block, all of the nodes of the DS committee are going to verify all of the transactions in these blocks individually. And they, do sure. not, they do not verify the transactions again. Otherwise, you know, the DS committee will become the bottleneck. It will defeat the purpose of sharding. All, it, all, all these nodes do uh, is uh, it will verify that uh, enough signatures have sort of validated the correctness of this transaction from that particular shard. Ah, so basically, if I'm a DS committee member at that point, I'm like, okay, I received that I received this micro block from shard two. Okay, I'm going to check which nodes are assigned to shard two in the past. Okay, I assigned these particular fifty nodes to that shard in the past. Then in the in this block, do I have two thirds of the signatures of these fifty nodes? Yes. Yes. Uh, tuck, 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 verify is are the signatures correct? Okay, these signatures there's more than two thirds signature. These signatures are correct. Okay, so I'm going to accept this micro block. So that's how I accepted the micro block of shard two. Then shard then I then similar way I accept the micro block of shard one, and then I say okay, uh, I'm then I am in a state where I say in principle I agree to including the micro blocks of shard one and two, like uh, these two blocks into the blockchain. And now then 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 I then just I'm just one DS committee member and the other DS committee members are having like like similar threads. So how do the DS committee members now come to consensus on whether these two blocks are finally? They actually run another round of consensus protocol. So okay. to make sure the final block is also final, you know, it's it has a finality. And that is also a PBFT. Yes. Ha ha. Okay. Okay. So basically, now, 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 like a user from the user perspective, I send a transaction to uh, Zinshu, and I have to wait that my transaction gets confirmed in, let's say, shard two, and then in, and then the block of shard two gets confirmed in the in with the DS committee. So yes. I have to wait for these two co confirmations, and these two confirmations have like strong finality. So once the block is made in the shard and in the DS committee, dang dang. I see these two blocks. Now my transaction is confirmed, and then Zinshu can basically give me the car or whatever I'm I'm looking to buy. So this is for very strong, you know, security. Uh, on the other hand, for for applications, you can you can use some heuristics. For example, when you see uh, your transaction is accepted by one shard, uh, you you may you may believe like ninety nine percent of the chances that uh, these these transactions will eventually go to the final connect uh, final final block, right? You can you can make assumptions like that. And for some application, let's say payments, it's fine because you just need to have some reserve to uh you know rectify some of the one percent exceptional cases in that case. So so that can give you sort of a very much shorter uh, latency. Cool. Yeah. So at least I I have a rough idea of. Uh, of, of Zilliqa now, better idea of how it works. Uh, can you tell us like what are sort of the scalability advantages of a of a design like that? So let's say we start start with like two shards, each with a hundred nodes or something. Let's start with like one uh, configuration, and as we add nodes, what what happens to the throughput of the system? So you, we are creating shards to ensure that you can do transactions parallel. That's the high level idea, right? Now, you, you need to have more shards if you want to more, to, you know, if you want to achieve better parallelization, right? So let's say if you have only two shards, you can do two times the processing. If you have four shards, you can do four times processing. If you have 10 shards, you can do 10 times processing. 
So ideally, uh, there, there are two parameters here. One is how many numbers of shot do you want? And what is the size of each shot, right? There are two parameters essentially. Well, roughly speaking, the more, in, I mean, the, the, if you increase the number of shots, your, your, your throughput will increase. And that is one really a big benefit in Celica, which is not the case with many blockchains that currently exist, which means that the more nodes you join your network, the better throughput you will get out of it. Okay, this is, this is uh, and th that's roughly linear, I would say, in the number of shots. Now, if, if you look at the other, other metric, which is how many nodes you should have in the shot, that's on the very crucial point for many reasons. One specific reason is security, right? So imagine a shard where you just put one single node. Well, then it becomes a centralized infrastructure, right? Then this shard gets to decide which transaction to accept, which transaction to reject. Okay. So you want to have more number of nodes in, a net, in, in each shard. It cannot, be, it cannot be just one. Now the question is, what is the ideal number? Okay. I mean, there, there are some terms that tell you that I mean, the more Net, the more nodes you add in the in the in the in, in each shard, the more secure you become against Byzantine adversaries. So I mean, it gives you a probability. So you know, the more more nodes you add, the probability will decrease exponentially. So we came up. With, so if you look at that formula, it, you, you can you will have this exponential kind of curve, and it will tell you that you know roughly six hundred nodes gives you a one over a million kind of yeah, kind of like probability. That. So you'd have roughly around six hundred to eight hundred nodes in each shard. To guarantee security, but if you need more, if you need better parallelization, you need more shots, more of such numbers. So, sort of the basic problem is uh, is is it is almost a problem of sampling and and like statistics. So, uh, I I don't remember the name of this exact problem, but the problem is something like you have I don't know you have ten thousand uh, instances of like I don't know you have. Let's let's say let's say we we talk about people, right? All of us have different heights, and let's say there's there's, there's like a group of ten thousand people. Now, out of this group of ten thousand people, I'm going to select uh, let's say like subgroups of hundred people. I'm going to sample groups of hundred people. Then, if the if the average height of this this group of ten thousand people is I don't know uh, one point eight meters. And if I'm sampling, like I'm taking out only 100 people and, me and measuring the average heights of these 100 people, then there is actually a chance that I might come across groups uh, which whose average height might be two meters, right? Even though the even though the population of those a population average of this 10,000 is 1.8 meters, randomness might ensure that I might select a group of these 100 people and the average height might be two meters. That can happen, right? So my Sample might not be representative of the larger group uh, if, if the sample is too small. And as the sample size becomes bigger, when I go from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400, uh, I will become more and more representative of the bigger group. So in some senses, I feel uh, uh, the formula you're referring to, the exponential curve you're referring to is a reflection of this fact that we are assuming at some level that once the nodes solve proof of work that there is a certain fraction of Byzantine nodes inside them. But we have like, let's say, let's say we have 2000 nodes and some fraction of it is Byzantine, 20% of it is Byzantine. But when you want to compose a shard, we want to sample this group of 2000 nodes, create a subset of it. So if we create a subset with only 100 nodes, there's a, there's, there's a higher chance that if, so let's say 200 nodes are Byzantine inside those 2000. If you're sampling groups of just 100 nodes, there's a high chance that we might encounter a group in which like 90, 90 nodes are Byzantine. Like we might create a shard with 90 Byzantine nodes and 10 honest nodes. But if we increase the size of the sample from let's say 100 to 500, then there's, we are somehow like, because we are sampling a larger set now, we're taking a larger set out of this 2000. If the bigger set of 2000 is majority honest, it increases the ch chance that my set of 500 is also going to be majority honest. It's, it's something like that, right? It's, it's, right. it's very, it's very When you think about in the extreme case, um, if we have 1000 nodes and then you know we only have one shard, 
let's say let's say we, we just make an assumption that uh, these original 1,000 loans only have uh, you know less than one third are presenting, and then it's actually 100 percent true that uh, this chart has you know less than one thousand uh, one third of the nodes are presenting right that's an extreme case we don't we don't need 100 percent we need 99.99999 percent you know something like that so that's what we do okay so so the rough heuristic you have derived from something like this is uh, uh, a shard or to have like between 600 and 800 members yes, yes. and uh, and then as as nodes are added um, we can we can increase the number of shards in, in right. some way. Okay, so uh, as I'm aware, like Zilliqa already has a private test net running, right? Um, yes. So, yes. so tell us, like, what are sort of the performance characteristics of of this this private test net? So uh, you know, at this stage, uh, it's it's basically running on AWS EC2 cloud. So we basically host a particular category of instances, uh, you know, virtual machines. Everyone, uh, virtual machine is running as a node in, inside our test net. And then uh, I think two weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, uh, when we scaled up to about 3,600 nodes uh, in our test net, we could achieve, uh, we could achieve uh, you know, a peak capacity of close to 2,500 transactions a second. So, you know, the, the interesting thing is uh, when we compare the results with the 3,600 nodes to, let's say, 1,200 nodes, we really see a linear curve, you know, in terms of throughput growth. So that basically sort of validated our, our original hypothesis that our throughput were linear growth. That's interesting. And to me, 3,600 nodes is still a very small network compared to today's popular public blockchains. And we really want to take this as a, as, as a start and we want to further grow that our projection is when we have uh, two, let's say 20,000 nodes, we should be able to reach about 8,000 to 10,000 transactions a second. And this is not to say that it's as straightforward as, you know, tomorrow we just get more money and expand our, you know, test net. It's, it's, it's not going to be that straightforward. I, I think we expect more sort of technical innovation we have to do along the way to achieve that. Goal. Okay, cool. So, uh... So I think so one of the final questions I have, and there's a lot to talk about the sharding model, certainly uh, it's, it's, it's like complex technology, but we have to go cover the other interesting part of Zilliga, which is the smart contract language design. And we have limited time, but before we get there, um, how what is the incentive structure for, for all of these nodes, including being a DS committee node and being a node processing transactions in this shard? Okay, so uh, uh, so we should we should look at a little bit about um, why incentive structure should be different in the first place compared to let's say Bitcoin or or Ethereum, and the reason is the consensus protocol. So if you look at the Bitcoin or or Ethereum's Nakamoto consensus protocol, there is one leader and he proposes a block, so he kind of does the hard work, right? So he gets gets the reward. Now it, in a PBFT kind of setting. Nodes which are there in the shard, they all together work, they sign transactions, they do all together work, and then they propose a block. So the point is, you know, you have to be, you have to do different, right? It cannot be just, just that way, the classical way. So what we, what we came up is, uh, is that if you want to give a reward, let's give reward to uh, uh, the leader in the DS committee and the leader in each shard, okay? So for, for every micro block proposed, by each shard, you will take the reward and then you divide it into these people. So all the leaders across shards and the, and the leader in the DS committee. Now what you might go with this model is that, what, what you might do with this model is that, after a particular period of time, you could change the, the leader in each shard, right? So this is how PBFT works. So there's a leader and then you can replace that leader with some other leader. And then, you know, you can eventually be able, you'll be eventually be able to reward every single member in the shard because every single member will eventually become a leader. So that's the that's the incentive incentive model. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, so only the only the leaders of these blocks are, are able to get rewards. So if I'm a new node joining in, if I solve the proof of work, become a member of the DS committee, for the first few blocks after I'm a member, I might not be the leader and I'll not make money at the at that time. But then 
eventually it's like a round it's like a round table it's like it will circulate back and i will become the leader and when i create a block i'm going to make money as a member of the ds committee and similarly if i'm a new node joining and i end up being assigned to shard 7 may not make any money because other people are pr proposing blocks but then my time to propose a block is going to come and i'll be the leader and at that point i'll, I'll make money so, so I mean, this this model has one advantage is is that you will have low variance, right? So in 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 Nakamoto kind of consensus protocol, you are kind of competing with everybody, right? So you know after after a few you know few time interval, you will you probably have a chance to get the become the leader and then you will get it, you will get the reward. Here it's it's different because the moment you get into a shot and if you stay there, you will have you will have rewards, and it's guaranteed. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Thanks. So in terms of like this whole sharding scheme, uh, what are the largest points of uncertainty for your team? Like things that, like design choices or places where you don't understand the choices you've made and things might go wrong. Hmm. That, that's a very good question. I think, I think at the high level, I would think uh, this, this sharding scheme is relatively um, sort of validated. Um, I would say, you know, the, the, the most challenging part is when we scale further. I think, you know, now it's 3,600 nodes. I don't, I don't think, you know, double that size will be an issue. But if we really go to um, something like 15,000 or 20,000, so we may run into some bottlenecks, which are not obvious at this moment. So that's something we have to really do with the experiment because many things can become bottlenecks. Like validation of transactions can become bottleneck, sending the micro blocks or sending the final blocks, you know, all these things may, may become a performance issue. So that's where we, we need to uh, experiment and then study further, try to figure out a better way to do things. So, so that's, that's my expectation. Yeah. Amrit? Yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's very similar to the point that you discussed, which is uh, you, you start with uh, the smallest shot that you can have let's say with 600 nodes, because going below that, you will have security risks. So you start with shard, and the more nodes come in, you keep on increasing the number of shards. At some point of time, you will have to come back and say, you know, now I probably have to increase the shard size, and I should not increase, let's say, a shard number, for instance. So it's, it's not very clear right now um, when and at what extent uh, we, should, we should make those choices. So it's like the trade-off between like sort of having larger shards and higher security. So the trade-off between like security throughput expressed as selecting the number of shards and nodes in a shard, right? Like you're yes. trying to optimize both security and throughput and the levers that you can pull are the number of shards that are going to be there in your network and uh, the nodes that are going to be there per shard. So how do you tweak these two parameters to op get an optimal of security and throughput? Is and the other point is how many nodes can we really support? That's another question. We cannot support, let's say, one million nodes. It's 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 not, you know, it, it won't work for any network. It won't work. If you let's say if you look at Bitcoin or Ethereum, if if they have one million nodes one day for some reasons, then you will have to propagate each block to the entire network, and that will take time. And if you don't give, if your interblock time is not you know sufficiently large, then you will have folks. Right, because you know some some people won't be seeing the right block, and then you would they'll be mining on a different block, and then you know you will have folks. So the what what would be the maximum network size that we should support is not very clear at the moment. So Zilliqa's other um, big innovation could be in the uh, in the paradigm of how smart contracts are executed inside Zilliqa and how they are programmed. So give us an overview of your uh, work and aims in, in, in that space. Okay, so uh, we would like to have a smart contract language, first of all, this is a design principle. And that's, that's why we started with something new. And the idea is that we want to have a language that is easy to reason about, considering the fact that we have all kinds of issues with uh, different kinds of smart contracts. So we need, we need a language that allows you to reason formally, which you could say, you know, if you run this contract, you're only going to see this, this, and this kind of behavior, not something else. Okay. That's, that's the high-level idea. And how would you do that is, is tricky. 
And the reason is that if you want to do, if you want to give very strong properties, if you want to prove very strong properties about, about your program, it cannot be a very, you know, it cannot be a very full-fleshed language because then it becomes very complicated to reason about. So you, you kind of, you want to have a language that's kind of, you know, it's not Turing complete, for instance. It could be, it could be a restrictive set, but, ex, you know, but, but which, which would allow you to have formal proofs, but should be expressive enough that should allow you to, you know, design interesting contracts. So this is, this is the high level of principle that we want to follow. And like, so you're working like smart contract languages. Is it like early or do you have some, some kind of specification and implementation of a language? So we don't have a specification right now. We are currently writing it. Uh, by the end of this month, we will have a, a, a formal document which would say what exactly a program in our smart contract would look like and what kind of properties you could prove uh, on, on those kind of uh, contracts. So one interesting thing is, you know, we also uh, want to balance between, you know, the security of the smart contracts and sort of, sort of uh, programmability. So if, if we ask uh, programmers today to write that kind of automata style language, it's, it's very tough, you know, the learning curve will be very stiff. So that's why we will try to uh, develop a solidity like syntax as well for, for, for programmers so they can, they can still write smart contracts in the familiar language uh, like today. And we will have a compiler and sort of compile that, that kind of syntax into this, this actual language for a smart contract. And of course, we will not be able to support 100% uh, of solidity syntax. And we may add on a little bit, but it's largely like that. So I, I almost feel like uh, we need a we need a separate episode on the smart contract language when when you're further along. Uh, yeah, we agree. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's a topic you know by itself. Yeah, why? Because like yeah, uh, I think we are we are towards the towards the end of the recording. So I think we we'll, let's schedule another one for uh, specifically for the smart contract execution environment and languages. But before we end off for today. Um, so, so Zilliqa, the network has uh, has its own cryptocurrency, which is which is Zillings. I like to know your plans about Zillings and when do you think uh, people will get Zillings in their own hands? Yeah, uh, we we issue Zillings as a utility token. So that means you know um, holders of Zillings will be able to send transactions, run smart contracts uh, on our platform. And uh, uh, we are planning to, to run a, a public contribution, um, a token generation event. So the exact date has not been fixed at this moment. So uh, it could be as early as end of November, or it could be as late as, you know, let's say early Jan. So, so you know, that's the rough uh, timeline we're, we're still thinking about this moment. Uh, at this stage, we are running an early contribution run. So some people really show very strong interest uh, to our project and then you know we try to work with them to get their support in terms of funding in terms of mining and in terms of application development you know various things so that's that's where we are in terms of fundraising okay do you have any any details on like what uh, what kind of emission curve zilliqa will end up having how many tokens will be issued in in the public contribution and then how will the network uh, go from there so I think I can give a, a rough uh, uh, idea on the you know token allocation, and then uh, Amrit can elaborate further on the emission specifically for the mining uh, rewards. So you know as we already mentioned, Zilliqa's technology has a feature. We have more miners in the network. We'll be able to process more transactions every second. So that's why in, in designing our token structure, we give uh, miners a slightly heavy pie. So basically, we plan to give at least forty percent of our total uh, token supply to uh, mining rewards over, let's say, ten years of time, and then you know we will uh, give our supporters uh, either in this uh, early contribution phase or in the public contribution phase about thirty percent of our token supply, and then the rest thirty percent uh, token uh, supply goes to this company, uh, Antrim, which uh, sort of developed this technology for the past two years, and a uh, Zilliqa Research. Zilliqa Research will be the entity going forward to, to you know, sort of spearhead this R&D of Zilliqa and try to engage the community, try to, you know, promote uh, Zilliqa to application developers to build high throughput apps on top of that. You know, basically, that's the entity going forward to lead Zilliqa. 
and then it will uh, some of the tokens will also go to founders, advisors, you know, agencies who are helping with us. You know, so that's the rough idea. And I think okay. I'm working. But yeah, yeah. So I just want to add a couple of sentences on the emission curve. So of course, I mean, as Shinsha said, we need more miners in the beginning because our network is 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 powerful, and it it will give you high throughput only when you have enough miners in your network. And to attract those miners, we'll have uh, uh, our emission curve will be kind of. Many, I mean, a large portion of that will be in the first few years, let's say first four years, so that people can come in and mine it, and then it will kind of exponentially decrease uh, over the next 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 years. Because the idea is, you know, over time there will be a high volume of transactions, so the transaction sort of gas fee will, will pick up as the the majority of incentive for miners. Hmm. That's super interesting. So, so yeah, so something like thirty percent for the company and Zilliqa Research, uh, forty percent uh, with forty percent of the token supply over ten years for the miners, with it being front loaded in 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 the in the short term. Like you can earn more in the first few years than you can in after after like five years uh, and later, and thirty percent to people spread across like. Um, Two contribution periods, like an early contributor, which is taking more risk, yeah. and a later contributor, which who is probably taking lesser risk when when much of the uncertainty has dissipated. Okay, that 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 sort of answers the question, and, and it makes sense. Cool. So uh, with that, uh, I I'd, I'd like to thank uh, you both of you, Zinshu and uh, and Amrit, for being on the on the show. It was great to have this conversation with you. Thank you very much. It was, it was really great. Yeah, lots of interesting discussions. Yeah. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning into the show. Uh, Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. You can find all of their shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. At Epicenter, we release episodes every, every Tuesday. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app for iOS and Android. You can also watch the video version of the show on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. If you're a loyal listener and have been enjoying the show, uh, we'd like to ask you for a favor. iTunes, re- iTunes reviews are really important for podcasts and help new people find the show. We'd like to have more iTunes reviews and, it, and would appreciate if you could leave a, a review on iTunes. And of course, you can send us a tip to the address in the show description if you find we produce valuable content. So until next time, it was uh, it was great having you, Jinshu and uh, Amrit.